Welcome back to Replatform TV. Today's episode is on how to improve your e-commerce shopping cart. So we're going to show you some examples uh, of what we think is good practice so you can get context for what we're talking about. But first, let's give you a little intro of why this is so important. So uh, on our Add to Cart episode a few weeks back, we talked about the importance of proving the Add to Cart user journey and why. Because average cart abandonment, according to Baymart Institute, is 68%. And whilst many abandons are natural, there are still a good number of abandons that are due to poor user experience or failure to tackle common barriers to purchase. So your main cart or shopping bag page plays a vital role in challenging shoppers into your checkout funnel, yet lots of carts are never completed. So we're going to look at 10 key things you should consider for your basket page to help reduce abandonment and improve customer experience. Paul, what do you typically find some of the most common shopper frustrations around baskets? Yeah, so um, a lack of clarity around shipping costs, duties and taxes, um, poor layouts and general kind of usability, um, too much distraction and too much going on, um, and then not clear how to kind of either move on to a next step or get help. Cool. So let's move on to our top 10. So I'll start with number one, basket summary and clear checkout call to action. So I'm going to use the example of Sephora. Um, they don't have a UK site, it's the French site, but they do some of the elements brilliantly. There are lots of other sites that, that, that do this well. This is a good example. So key things including cost breakdown, show subtotals, shipping. AO.com is another great example of breaking it down. But also consider things like pinned. So not all sites do this, and Sephora doesn't. But if you've got lots of items in the basket and the user has to scroll down below the fold, make sure that summary is pinned so they still have visibility of that call to action to go into checkout. You want to drive people into checkout as quickly as possible. Also, things like test label language. I've seen simple tests where, um, you know, buy now uh, has performed worse than checkout. Saw that for a fashion retailer. Sometimes the language can put people off. What I like about Sephora, uh, design's quite visually clear and consistent with the brands, but I like this simple touch of like Vuse Economise, which means you're saving five uh, euros 40. So they're emphasizing saving. Again, that's kind of like reassurance and persuasion method, meth, um, methodology there. The other thing within the summary is be clear on things like payment options. Use of icons is standard. You don't have loads of text on it. Make sure there's alt text behind it. And simple buttons uh, for things like PayPal, Apple Pay, where you can speed up the purchase without going through a standard checkout. Um, what's what's your uh, first item, Paul? Sure. So um, my first one is increase AOV and basket size with upsells. Um, so ideally, you would have very complementary items. Um, you could use uh, kind of item. Yeah, I personally really like when you have a proposition um, that kind of really positions the additional item well. So this example on your screen is from Kettle and Fire. Um, and the proposition is your order goes great with. So even though it's quite light, there's still kind of a bit more uh, justification or a bit more reasoning behind it. And then it's a one click add to order. Um, so I think that works really well. Um, personalization can also work here and, you know, automation can support this. Um, but personally, I'm a big fan of kind of manual or rule based based on what item or items are in cart. Um, so Cat and Fire on the screen is a good example. A Day is another good example. Um, Primal Kitchen is a really nice example where they have a one click subscription upsell. And actually, uh, Cat and Fire has something similar with the setup now. Um, but the with Primal Kitchen, it's the actual recommendation itself where you've just got add um, upgrade to subscription, which is good. Um, and then Rafa is also a nice example of gift wrap upsell as well, which you can add for five pounds within the basket summary. Excellent. One I like well for um, uh, complex catalogues is on AO.com for electricals. They they don't just focus on product upsells. They also do service upsells, which works yeah. really well. So you can see here um, clients delivered and installed on the same day. They also do recycling of old appliances. And that ties in well with, with some of the kind of environmental responsibilities in that space. Cool. So let's move on. So number three for me is consistent design with your mini basket. So for most sites where when you have items in the basket, you know, there's a state change, you can see it and you can interact with it and it will show you what's in the basket. So the most important thing for me is when, when you have a like bar, mini basket expansion state and you have a main basket page, just make sure the design and the, and the patterns are similar so people get used to knowing where to find information. Cart drawers seem to be an increasingly popular pattern. I know you've talked a lot about them, Paul, and Shopify stores seem to adopt this more and more as a standard, especially like plantedfeet.com. Um, show an example here, you can use Pangaea, you know, sustainable um, fashion retailer. They use this pattern. If I click on the bag, 
there's a slide out pattern. Now, if I add to the cart, you see it comes back in here as that exact same pattern, close it, come back in. Wherever I get to in a cart, whether it's expanding from the header navigation or going into the main cart page, this is how it looks, so I have consistency. <laughs> Right. Um, and then my next one is essentially providing reassurance through that cart experience, be it as part of the um, off canvas cart draw or the cart page itself. Um, so the first one is comms around shipping duties and, and taxes. So the shipping piece, we've got a good example from Rafa. Um, so again, just kind of adding clarity and making sure there are no kind of barriers here. So just um, making it clear that uh, shipping cost and ideally uh, add some context around uh, timescales if you can. Um, shoe, uh, another one is kind of making sure that people can, if they need to, get help. So shoe is a good example of where if someone shows signs of inactivity, um, a live chat prompt uh, will then appear. So that's perfect timing. And that's just by example. magic. Yeah, which is great. Um, and then another one is just um, kind of from a um, an assurance perspective, uh, payment icons, security certificates, all of that kind of stuff can work really nicely. Excellent. I love the way that just appeared perfectly as if we scripted yeah. it. <laughs> Things do go right sometimes on the <laughs> videos. Uh, so number five is uh, provide helpful information on tax and duties. So for international, this is really important. Clarifying to people whether tax and duties are liable. Are you paying them online? Are they payable on collection? What is an estimation? And it's complex to do this within a lot of e-commerce platforms, but there are specialist plugins. Um, you know, Zonos for Shopify, Avalar is an incredibly popular uh, tool that a lot of um, big retailers use. It's arguably the market leader, it takes care of VAT, GST, sales tax, etc. And some countries, especially like US, with so many different states and different sales tax rules, it's complex to, to stay on top of. Um, I think it's really, really uh, interesting to see how it's done. This is an example of a, a plugin. You can see in the basket, it opens up. This is on us, and it will give you estimated duties and taxes. You can change your country and update it as well. Really nice and simple. Doesn't kill the UX overall UX of the page. It's non intrusive, but it's helpful in giving people that extra information. Right. And then uh, my next one is usability. So kind of making the car experience as usable as possible across all, to all forms of devices. Um, so the first one is making it really easy for shoppers to update um, quantity and update their basket. So making sure that people don't have to constantly um, kind of up press the update button after they've changed the quantity. Um, and then also uh, making it easy to remove items as well. Um, I, I, another one I would suggest is testing the placement and positioning of input fields. So be that for gift cards or discount codes, um, because that can have a really big impact on performance um, and whether or not to include it on the cart. So that can be a barrier, for example. Um, if an item's out of stock, make sure it's really clear that item's out of stock and kind of give the user a next step or a timescale for the item coming back in if that's applicable. Um, that's uh, something that can be, uh, that's commonly um not handled very well by different brands and retailers. Um, and then lastly, um, if you, uh, if particularly if you're kind of a lower end retailer and, uh, and users are likely to have a number of items in the cart, make it easy for people to move items to the wish list or save for later. So that's a really good example on Farfetch on James's screen. Cool. So number seven is shown estimated shipping charges. We kind of touched on this earlier about basket summaries. Uh, you know, a lot of retailers I've been in conversation say, but we don't know until we get the addresses, and that's fine. I get it. You can't be 100% accurate, but show estimated and show defaults, especially if you have multiple countries. Like if, if you know somebody's on a UK site, you can make the assumption that, that, that most of the deliveries are going to, to UK address. Just show a from. If you have free delivery, put free delivery available. It's, it's all about taking away those potential barriers in the checkout where suddenly hidden costs get thrown into the basket and it, it annoys people. So here's the example on Farfetch again, shipping, £10, one shipping fee. So again, reassurance that if you add more items, you're not going to suddenly pay more shipping. Okay. And then my next one is service-based messaging. Um, so make it really clear around processes for shipping, uh, click and collect, um, reserve and collect, returns, etc. So Farfetch is a really good example. Um, and you can see they've also used the, they've made this clear and then they've also got their reviews and the rating there as well. Uh, so this was a really good example from James. 
Um, Love Honey tested showing trust pilot review snippets and increased their conversion rate. Another really good example from James. And then uh, Benson's uh, uses icons to promote things like finance options. Excellent. I'd love to throw an adult um, sex toys uh, <laughs> site into the mix just to liven it up. Audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, my next one is, so number nine is provide contextual offers to boost basket size. So we, we've kind of covered this. I'm not going to reiterate too much, but it's set up rules based on contents and value. Like if you have a free delivery order threshold, put a simple rule in that if people need X amount uh, of pounds more to spend to reach it, show them that. Um, Pangaea does this nicely. You may or may not remember from earlier. Oh, go to the right tab. You can see here, spend £37 more to get free shipping. So a nice way to try and eat, to nudge up basket value. Um, as we showed the AO example, um, AO is using things like service, so uh, appliance removal and recycling to try and nudge it up. So lots of ways that you, could, you can do this. Just think about what is relevant with different types of product. Right. And then my final point is test discount codes uh, carefully. So this can have a really big impact on journeys. Um, and something that um, we've seen historically um, is prominent discount code boxes can create more exits where people are going and actually searching for a discount code. And then when they can't find it, um, it kind of fragments the journey. Um, also, it can encourage price comparison as well, which can be uh, which can prevent people from buying from you, and again, just prolong that uh, journey. Um, this is why price match messaging can be used really well. So, uh, Curry's PC World and Best Buy are good examples, um, and then brands like AO.com um, have text. Uh, I have a discount code that then opens up the discount box. But again, I think that's as I mentioned earlier, an important thing to test and try different approaches with. Cool. And I just realized in my last one, I completely forgot to show the example of um, targeted promotions based on products in bag. And this is AO.com with a soundbar promotion based on TVs. And it's not eligible to every TV. They've obviously set up and understood which soundbar, which TVs this particular soundbar is eligible and compatible with. So nice, nice example there. And look, you can see a code and it's telling you where to add it in the box below. Um, cool. So we've gone through our top 10, Paul. Let's simplify it for people. What's your key takeaway? So I think ultimately uh, mine, and this is, I guess, semi-obvious, but keep things super simple, uh, focus on mobile. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's kind of the thing that, although everyone knows the importance of mobile, I feel like a lot of this stuff isn't done as well on mobile sites. So that's kind of my main takeaway. Yeah, agreed. Keeping it visually simple, focus customers on the most important elements, which is the basket contents and being able to review and update and then move into checkout. Add everything else carefully and judiciously through proper testing, because it's amazing. Even simple changes to a checkout can adversely impact conversion rate. It's the last thing you want to do. Um, cool. So thanks as always for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know uh, whether these insights are useful. And then also let us know if you use them to improve your, your website. We'd love to know how you're doing it. If you've got any tips of your own or want to challenge anything you said, please do add a comment and do, do like the video. We want to know how many people like it. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for next week's episode. Form.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.